uh, welcome to the session. So this is the multi-host NIC management in the out of band using standards. So today we are going to cover like why we need OCP NIC. Just a quick background on OCP NIC itself and then look at like how do you configure, control, and monitor the NIC from BMC and like update the BMC using out of band. So these are the topics that we are going to cover in today's uh, summary. So for this one, I will take the multi-host system, Yosemite, as an example. This is a case study. And if you look at this uh, multi-host system, it has four different servers. Each one needs its own network interface. And BMC is another entity that needs out-of-band uh, connectivity for the network. So if you look at this uh, module, we have the NIC module here at the front of the uh, at the front of the system, and then there's only one cable that goes out of the out of the whole slide. So you can imagine like there are at least five entities that want to talk to the external network using one cable. And that's where we need like multi-host NIC um, in the system. So this is the topology, like a logical topology. So as you can see, there are four independent servers, and then the BMC, and sharing one multi-host NIC, something like this and having one cable going out. So a quick background, like why do we need a OCP NIC? So why not use regular you know, available interfaces? So the solutions at that time, when we decided to kind of go with the OCP before that, so one option was to kind of use the CPU complexes network interface. Like CPUs have a built-in NIC, why don't you use that? The other option is, uh, why don't you have another NIC chip outside on the board? connect it externally. And the third one is like buy some PCIe adapter card and then use it for the networking. So these are the three or four options that we had on board before deciding to go with OCP NIC. Or decide like, I mean, why, why do you want to build another uh, proprietary interface? But in our case, we ended up doing like open standard. So it's became OCP standard now. So some of the design level considerations, system level considerations for design are listed here. So if you look at the top one, like say, we moved from one gig to 10 gig to 100 gig in like uh, six, seven years. So back in like 2011, the systems like the CPUs, they are coming up with one gig. But at that time, we were planning to move to 10 gig. So, and some of the data centers are like still at one gig. So now we need a solution where we can deploy this compute server in both data centers, which can take one gig, system, one gig network, or it can operate at 10 gig. So that's one reason why we had to choose uh, OCP as a separate NIC or module, module format. And then if we had to use PCIe, we could have solved that problem. But the uh, size of the PCIe card is big. And also it takes up one of the slot on the available short form uh, system that we built today. It has about two or three. And we use it for like uh, other uh, storage option. So we don't want to lose one PCIe slot just for the networking. And then multi-host environments is another uh, another thing. So any option that we come up with, if it does not support multi-host, we cannot use that. So in this case, since the uh, card is outside, we can connect as many hosts as we want based on the uh, multi-host link. And other uh, consideration was the uh, power. So most of these networking has to work when it is out of band, in the sense like say, when system is not powered on the x86 processor. Still, we should be able to talk to the BMC and then shut off the power or turn it off or on based on the need. So in that case, we need this networking uh, subsystem to work in the standby case. So it need not have full power. So that's one of the considerations. So considering all of these uh, um, options, I, we thought the better option is to build a standard, uh, a different standard in a compact format, and that gives us options to kind of move uh, in different technologies. So how did it evolve, actually? So in 2011, we identified this problem. And then the first spec is a 0.5 version, and that has by 8 PCIe Gen 3, and it supports 10 gig. The, the, the spec was in OCP uh, around 2012. And after that, uh, 2015, there was a second version, which supports up to 100 gig, and more PCIe lines. And on the sideband, original version has only I2C, and now we added NCSI to kind of do faster uh, transfer. 
And the next version is coming up this year. I think this year in the OCP, it's getting announced. So you'll be seeing pretty soon the spec out. And what about adoption? So if you look at like around the booths, you can find a lot of OCP NICs that are being made to this spec. So a lot of industry adoption for this form factor so that people can use that for their own use cases internally. I will hand over to Hemal. Can you hear me? Can you hear me in the back? Okay. So uh, thanks, I uh, and you all. Uh, I'm gonna uh, cover some of the NIC use cases and specifically what multi-host NIC management brought up uh, and how standards help. And then we'll end up with the firmware update, which is one of the interesting problem multi-host NIC brings up. So to start with what you see here, these are the standard uh, NIC management use cases, whether single host or multi-host, you will see most of them today. Like you want to get the basic uh, NIC inventory information, get to know the statistic, the monitoring of data, control some of the configuration like link setting. Uh, also, sorry. We have a demo going on in the other room, that's fine. Okay, sorry about that. So um, back to, so those type of use cases, in addition to that, this is a shared NIC model. So the pass-through traffic for management is being uh, communicated through the NIC. And same NIC is also providing the host traffic. So it is, NIC is the one that's responsible for splitting the incoming traffic, whether host traffic or management traffic, or on its way out, it will merge uh, host and management traffic together. And BMC has this sideband channel through which it's communicating that management traffic to the NIC, and NIC is the one responsible for putting it on the network or getting it off from network and sending it to BMC. So that all intelligence with NCSI and uh, standard management sideband interface uh, that resides in the NIC, uh, and it covers these use cases. In addition, there are case uh, use cases which are not covered by NCSI standard today is, as you look at the servers, uh, you want to know, uh, for thermal reporting, you want to know what specific temperature this NIC is operating at. Uh, also, today's NICs are fairly complex. They're running number of firmware images on it, which is tied to some of the firmware inventory and firmware update uh, management that BMC is doing. So th these are some additional use cases, uh, and they, they become more important as you go to multi-host, because with multi-host, one of the problem is you cannot assume that single host uh, is going to be able to control uh, the NIC, because from the host standpoint, NIC is shared, so all host resources are isolated. And that's the same set of NIC uh, resources are shared with BMC also. So it's a very shared NIC model, so one host cannot really uh, have priority over other hosts. So you are not going to treat one host more important than other. So that specifically brings out some of the multi-host management use cases. First one is uh, you, if you want to support your standard BMC model as well as if you want to have virtual BMC which is tied to Per host, you have a separate BMC instance running on the BMC hardware. You need to have the MAC addresses that are being provisioned, either by BMC or NIC. In this case, it makes sense for NIC to provision those kind of MAC addresses, and then BMC can retrieve it from the NIC and then use it for communication. So that's one use case. Um, there are applications today also that host wants to communicate to local BMC. There are different interfaces, uh, standard, your HTTP interface, there are also interfaces like KCS or serial people use for local host to BMC communication. Uh, with multiple hosts, now you get into multiple host to BMC channel because there is no single host. So you need to have host to BMC configuration and control been residing in the NIC and separately controlled by BMC on per host basis. 
So that's also uh, a use case that comes with the multi-host. And then if you really look at uh, with multi-host NIC, as Sai was talking about, you don't want hosts to have control over some of the basic configuration of the NIC because that's also shared by the BMC. So for example, how the bandwidth gets divvied up, that is one area where BMC can, as a part of provisioning the system, can go and configure the NIC in a way that it, either the bandwidth is equally divided between the host or maybe some percentage of bandwidth being allocated to each host. So the, these are, uh, the, the point here is without multi-host NIC, when sideband interface and NIC uh, to BMC communication was designed and standardized, these were the use cases they were not really considered. So going forward in NCSI and other, for multi-host NIC, we are considering all these use cases. Additionally, firmware is one of the key uh, issue today that how do you update firmware on the NIC? In multi-host scenario, it leads to uh, interesting issue if multiple hosts are simultaneously updating the firmware then there is a chance that they might overwrite or the, uh, who wins, depending on that, that version will be available there. So safer model for that is doing everything out of band. So with multi-host, out of band firmware update even becomes more important. And then we'll go in more detail on, there is a standard that DMTF defined for that, PLDM for firmware update. Uh, so, the, the point here is for all these use cases, we want to leverage the existing standard that we have today in NCSI. So previous two slides ago, the standard use cases are covered by this. We are working on NCSI 1.2 where we will add this additional uh, multi-host specific capability so that you can still use the standard NCSI control and configuration and then uh, manage those multi-host multi -host NIC use cases. Uh, as you know, NCSI, uh, there, it's supported over, initially it started with RMII-based transport. For that, it's, uh, you can think about it's uh, Ethernet connection between BMC and NIC. You can have multiple NICs. Uh, in that case, it will be hardware arbitration or uh, software arbitration scheme. Then it's more like a bus configuration. But uh, the point here, in initially it was RMIA-based transport, so your medium, uh, physical medium, uh, was all Ethernet-based and you were using uh, Ethernet packet format uh, for pass-through as well as the NCSI command and response. Uh, this NCSI interface has been extended now to also work on other medium, whether it's SMBus or PCI VDM, and that's where <coughs> NCSI or MCTP, uh, SMBus standard comes into picture. So this allows you to now do the same NCSI control commands. If you are a PCI NIC and you don't have RMII uh, interface, then you can use this to get to the same NCSI control command and responses that you can execute over that. So for OCP NIC, we do have RMII interface as well as SMBus, so you do get both choices. Uh, uh, but in general, by having this NCSI mapping over both allows all the implementation to have NCSI communication between BMC and uh, NIC. And especially for multi-host NIC, uh, this connectivity, you can add more capability on top of that than you can cover other use cases I mentioned. So, now if you really look at this multi-host NIC uh, from the connectivity standpoint and what interfaces are available, this is the, this is the stack that OCB NIC uh, from the BMC side as well as from the NIC side, you need to look at it. So if you look at RMII side interface, that's your NCSI, uh, traditionally NCSI or RMII. And then if you add SMBus and PCI VDM there are binding defined for both uh, physical medium for MCTP. And then on top of that, you can run either MCTP control, uh, PLDM, or NCSI. And each one covers different use case. With MCTP control, you can uh, basically do the transport level discovery. PLDM will look at its specific 
things like firmware update model, transferring BIOS data, uh, that's where you use PLDM. And for all other NIC monitoring control and inventory function, you have NCSI. So this layered model really helps here because now your sideband interfaces, depending on whichever you have, you can still get to all the your control and configuration uh, related data. And I think before, before we go to the next one, uh, one point I want to make is we will now focus on one specific PLDM for firmware update, which solves one of the interesting use case for multi-host NIC, where you want to do out-of-band firmware update and not have host actually update the firmware on the NIC. So you, UL is going to go in depth on that uh, specific standard. Thanks, Emil. OK, so what's the um, background of, of PLDM for firmware update? In principle, DMTF defined the standard reference here. It's 267 which defines a method for a BMC to update firmware on a given device using the PLDM protocol. Now, that standard is intended really to, to, to make things in, in order, Main, making sure that you have the protocol defined, you have the file format, and even the procedure, the control, the sequence of how to uh, guarantee that the right device is updated at the right time and the sequence is guaranteed between multiple devices if needed to be updated together. However, if we look deeply into that one, uh, practically it relies on an update agent. Typically it's the BMC, which is in charge of um, pushing the new firmware image into the target devices. And a single file uh, may integrate firmware for multiple devices, if you wish. So you can update, let's say, your NIC and then your uh, disk controller and so on and so forth. Um, and each device and each firmware uh, is independently updated. Now, the standard requires, and this is a delicate point, and this is why we need to have this talk today, the standard defines practically that both the BMC, the update agent, sends commands to the target device, but the device being updated needs also to send command to the update agent. Therefore, both needs to send commands to each other. This is um, something which cannot be done over RBT today, because um, the original definition was based on MCTP protocols, which allow that, but RBT does not allow to do that. If we try to map, and I'm not going to dive into this uh, complex diagram, on the left side you have the state diagram, which illustrates the sequence of uh, updating firmware in device. On the right side, you, right side you can have the message exchange between the uh, update agent and the firmware device. but What's important to memorize from this slide is the red lines. Red lines are exactly the commands which the firmware device needs to send to the update agent. And there are numerous of them. It's not trivial, and we had to address that issue. Now, in order to address that, um, as part of uh, the coming NCSI 1.2, uh, and that proposal was already uh, published as work in progress, what we call WIP in uh, DMTF. Uh, we are working on a new method which will allow exactly to close that gap. Once that gap is closed, you don't care if you use MCTP or you use RMAI. You can update firmware from BMC to any device regardless of your physical interface. And that's the main message here. So how does it work? Practically, uh, if a device cannot send command to the BMC, then we have a gap here. So the uh, responsibility of making sure that all these commands will be really serviced moves back to the BMC in this case. So the BMC sends query commands for checking whether or not there are pending PLDM commands that should be serviced by the BMC, commands which originate from the device, from the firmware device or the NIC in our case, okay? 
The NIC responds if there are such commands and embed those commands in the reply. In response to that, the BMC operates on those commands and the response to those commands is sent as another command back to the NIC. So practically, by using two messages instead of one, we can overcome that gap. Now, you would come and say, okay, this implies that the BMC needs to periodically come and check whether or not there is a pending command, which makes a lot of real-time overhead on the BMC. Now, in order to come that, there is a standard command within NCSI called AEN, which is pretty much the only message that is not passed to traffic that a NIC is allowed to send to a BMC. AEN stands for Asynchronous Event Notification. So if there is such a command and if the BMC can accept so type of that type of commands, then the NIC will notify asynchronously to the BMC and save the need for periodic polling. And only when needed, those messages will be notified to the BMC. So if we uh, try to look on, on what it gives us, then practically the uh, next step, as uh, Hermel showed earlier, we have the OCP 3.0, that's the new form factor that is coming now. Uh, the card uh, uh, now notifies the system, okay, about its capability. It's not so trivial to tell a system, when you have a, a known system, let's say, and you plug a, a given card into that one, can that card operate in multi-host? Can it only support a single host? Not obvious. Not always it's possible. How can the card know if it is being plugged into a multi-host system or into a single host system? Also not so obvious. So the new definition of OCP 3.0 includes encoding for all these pieces of information, allowing both the system and the NIC to automatically reconfigure themselves. So if you'll take a multi-host capable NIC and plug it into a single host system, automatically it will behave as a single host NIC. Take the same NIC, plug it into a multi-host system, and it will change its personality and start behaving as a multi-host NIC. No configuration other than that is needed. Everything is done automatically through those configurations which are already part of NCSI 3.0 pinout definition. Okay, so the card exposes its capabilities to the system. The system exposes its type to the card. And this predefined uh, uh, configuration outcome for each and every combination of card type and system type. So it guarantees that uh, no matter what happened, you know the outcome of that. Even if you'll take a single host card and plug it into a multi-host system, it will still work at least with one of the hosts in that system. But you will never have a brick, for example, which is not less important. So the uh, current uh, spec NIC 3.0 includes support for one host, two hosts, even four hosts. You may have even a single host with one socket or tool sockets, or even quad sockets, where each of those sockets independently connect to the NIC. Those NICs will identify those operating modes and always <coughs> act properly. Okay? So, what we would like to summarize here is practically that when we converge and define standards for such <coughs> an important item, it really allows multiple vendors like Broadcom, like Metalink, Melanox, sorry, in our case, uh, uh, to offer uh, hardware solutions for the system members, <coughs> okay, and they can choose. At the same time, when we design our cards, we know that we can offer the same card to different vendors, and it will also work. So it guarantees both the interoperability 
of the add-in devices and those devices into multiple systems and guarantee that uh, you can have the <coughs> possibility to choose. And uh, having that in place is really the, the most important thing uh, when we talk about standards. You don't have to customize stuff. You don't have to do custom design. The same hardware, if it follows the same standard, that's it. It just works. Uh, questions? Yes? Is MCSI over SMBUS already available? NCSI over S MCTP over SMBUS is available, yes. So today, if you would like to have NCSI, you can do it. NCSI over MCTP over SMBUS, NCSI over MCTP over PCIe VDMs, or NCSI over RBT, everything is supported. And you, if you wish, a different... Uh, uh, operating times in your system, let's say in standby, you wish to switch to use SMBus. In uh, full power mode, you would like to use the faster interface like PCIe. You can even migrate between those dynamically. Any more questions? I, th I think just one uh, with on that question. Yeah. Oh, I heard. Yeah. Oh, that question, OCP mass Turado has support for RMII and SMBus. And With OCP NIC, 3.0, you have support for all three. Yes. Including, so just one or two. The OCP NIC spec, the, uh, 2.0, which is pretty much everything that's out there right now, mm -hmm. uh, in the showroom, uh, does not support really MCTP over PCIe VDMs, but once uh, 3.0 will be used, it's out there. Any more questions? Thank you very much. Thanks.